right, this is the third part of lecture three, so lecture 3b. We're going to finish up Exodus, and we're going to swiftly go through Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, but first, let's watch the second half of the Exodus video from the Bible Project. Lord chapters 1 through 18, which tell the foundational story of how God rescued the enslaved Israelites by confronting and defeating Pharaoh, while offering a way of escape through the blood of the Passover lamb. God then delivered his people by bringing them through the waters of the sea and then into the wilderness, where, surprisingly, they grumbled and complained. Now, the second half of the book of Exodus opens as Moses leads Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai where God invites the nation of Israel to enter into a covenant relationship. And here we reach another key moment in the biblical storyline, because this is picking up and developing God's promise to Abraham. So remember, from the book of Genesis, God promised that through Abraham's family, somehow he would restore his blessing to all of his nation. And here we find out more. God says that if Israel obeys the terms of the covenant, they will be so shaped by God's laws and teaching and justice they will become a kingdom of priests, which means that they will become God's representatives and show all of the other nations what God is truly like. Now the people of Israel eagerly accept the offer, and so God's presence appears right on the top of Mount Sinai in the form of cloud and lightning and thunder. And Moses goes up as their representative, and God opens with the basic terms of the covenant, the famous Ten Commandments. These are like the basic terms of the agreement how the Israelites and God are going to relate to each other. And then after this come another collection of commands which fill out the first ten in more detail. There are laws about Israel's worship, about social justice, how they are to live together, all shaping Israel into a nation of justice and generosity that's different from the other nations. So Moses writes down all of these laws and he brings them down to the people who, again, eagerly agree to enter into this covenant with God. And once they do so, God takes the relationship forward another step. He tells Moses that he wants his holy, divine, and good presence to come and dwell right in the midst of Israel, which develops another aspect of God's covenant promises. So remember, after humanity's rebellion in the garden, it was access to God's presence that was lost. But now it's through the family of Abraham that God's presence is becoming once again accessible. Through this covenant relationship, and first with Israel, and then somehow, one day to all nations. So what follows are seven chapters of detailed architectural blueprints about this sacred tent called the tabernacle. There's the outer courtyard with an altar, and then in the center there's a tent that has an outer room and then an inner room. And then inside the inner room, which is called the most holy space, is a golden box called the Ark of the Covenant. And there's angelic creatures over the top of it. It's the hot spot of God's presence. Now, there's lots of detail in these chapters, and it's important to know that every piece has some kind of symbolic value. All of the flowers, the angels, the gold, and the jewels, it all echoes back to the Garden of Eden, the place where God and humans live together in intimacy. And so the tabernacle is like a portable Eden, so to speak. It's the place where God and Israel can live together in peace, at least in theory, because right here, something goes really, really wrong. Israel breaks. As Moses is up on the mountain receiving the blueprints for the tabernacle, down below at the camp, the Israelites, they're losing patience. And so they ask Moses' brother Aaron to make for them a golden calf idol so they can worship it as the God who saved them out of slavery in Egypt. Now God's presence is right there on top of the mountain. They can see it. But here they are below, breaking the first two commands of the covenant they just agreed to. No other gods and no idol. Now what follows is really important. God knows what's happening down below. And so he first invites Moses into his own anger and panic. And he tells Moses what he wants to do, just to wipe Israel out. But Moses intercedes by appealing to God's character. He says, first of all, destroying Israel would be going back on your covenant promises to Abraham. And then Moses appeals to God's reputation among the nations. What would they think if they see you destroying your own people? And so God accepts Moses' session, and he relents. And while he does bring his judgment on those who instigated the idolatry, he forgives the nation as a whole and promises to renew his covenant. And it's right here, at this point in the story, that God, for the first
first time, describes his own character to Moses. He says, The Lord is merciful, is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in covenant faithfulness. He forgives sin, but he will not leave the wicked unpunished. So we have this tension. God is full of mercy, but also he must deal with evil if he claims to be good. And above all, God is faithful to his promises, even though it means he knows he's committing himself to a people who are utterly faithless. And so after renewing the covenant with Israel, God commissions Moses to go ahead and build the tabernacle. And once again, we get five long chapters describing in detail the construction of the tabernacle. And it all comes together in the final chapter, where the tabernacle's finished. God's glorious divine presence comes and hovers over the tent, and our hopes are high. And so Moses, he goes right up to enter into the tent, and he can't. He actually can't go in, and that's how the book ends. It's really surprising, but not really if you think about it. You can see now how much Israel's sin has damaged the relationship with God in more ways than we realize. So the book opens, remember, with Pharaoh's evil, threatening Israel and threatening God's covenant promise. But now, as the book ends, Israel has become its own worst enemy. It's their sin that's threatening the future of the covenant. And so the question, as the book closes, is how is God going to reconcile this conflict between his holiness and his goodness and his presence with the sinful corruption of his own covenant people? The solution to that problem is what the next book is about. But for now, that's the book of Exodus. So we finished the videos in the books of, book of Exodus. I just want to highlight a couple of important things. Um, we, uh, t as far as the narrative goes, um, it actually takes from Exodus 19 to Numbers 10 to describe uh, the time period when the Israelites were staying out at Mount Sinai. Um, and it talks really about how God is making a covenant or a promise relationship with Israel. Um, one of the key elements of that covenant um, is the Decalogue. This is uh, the word that we use to talk about the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. Um, and these are pretty famous and have been throughout history. Um, it's important to note that um, it, the, the reason it seems that God gave these uh, laws to Israel to follow is so that they could show the character of their God to other people. Um, it was not that the covenant was necessarily contingent on it. If they broke the covenant or they broke the commandments, they would be out. Because um, we see over and over again in the Old Testament that um, that God continues to be faithful even in the midst of a people who is unfaithful. Um, but this is a way to model what God's character is like and how people, um, the Israelite people, should treat one another and should treat God. In fact. The first four commandments relate to, uh, to Israel's relationship to God. You shall know other gods before me, or make a graven image, or take the name of the Lord in vain, um, and remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Um, the next six commandments, five through ten, relate to Israel's relationship to one another or within the social order. Um, so the honor your father and mother, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal. Do not bear false witness and do not covet. So these co commandments cover um, the basis of how to treat one another and how to treat God. Um, it makes sense later when Jesus says all of the law and prophets hang on the two commandments, love God and love neighbor. Um, and these ten commandments become the foundation, um, the building blocks on which the entire legal code um, in the Old Testament will be built. And also later legal codes um, that will uh, become central to the Jewish faith. Um, now the video kind of got us to the end of Exodus. Um, lots, was go lots was going on between uh, Israel and um, God. Um, and the main idea by the end was that even though God had proven faithful, um, the people continued to um, break the law, and it was um, it was hard for these people to be uh, in relationship with the holy God. And so Leviticus then, um, the whole thing theme of Leviticus is holiness and God's holiness, um, and how it is that these people who are sinful who continue in disobedience, can have a relationship with a holy God. Um, we will not watch this video um, right now, but I'm going to post all of these um, PowerPoints as PowerPoint slides, and you can come back and watch the video 
um, on holiness to give you a little bit of background about God's holiness and what um, how that becomes the central uh, factor in sacrifice and atonement. There's also a video about atonement and sacrifice um, that you can watch later as well. But Leviticus, the whole book, is really concerned with two main main questions. How can people have a right relationship with God? Um, and what do people do? How do they atone for sin when they sin so that they can con continue in that relationship with the Holy God? Um, I have also the video here for numbers, but we won't watch it. Um, you feel free to go back and watch the Bible Project video for this one. Um, numbers um, is an interesting narrative. Um, it basically, the theme of the whole story is movement towards the promised land. So the people um, are, are trying to get to the land that God has promised them. Um, and then you also get a very uh, recurring theme of the disobedience and the grumbling of God's people. Um, this narrative covers 38 years um, in the desert. And, and most of the time, people, the people of Israel are wandering and they're rebelling. Um, and we learn by the end that because of their disobedience, the whole generation that came from Egypt um, will not be able to, to enter the promised land, including Moses. Um, the only people who will are Joshua and Caleb. Um, and these are the two men who, when they sent in spies to the promised land, um, 12 spies, uh, they came back and 10 of them um, did not have faith in God that they could actually take this land. And Joshua and Caleb, two of the uh, of the the 12 spies did. They said, this is what God has asked us to do. This is what God has promised us to do. So we will go into it. And so they end up being the only two um, that will enter the promised land. So the last book of the Pentateuch or the Torah is Deuteronomy. Um, and here you can watch the Bible Project video on Deuteronomy if you would like. Um, but the theme throughout Deuteronomy is basically instruction to the nation. Because here we are at the end um, of Israel's journey through the wilderness, and they are poised on the edge of the promised land, about to enter it. But Moses knows that he cannot go. Um, God has told him that he will not be going into the promised land. Um, and so basically he gives um, these sermons, or maybe Deuteronomy can be described as one long sermon um, that Moses gives to the people uh, to make sure that they're going to remain faithful to God as they enter the promised land. Um, so Deuteronomy forms a, a bridge between the Pentateuch, the first five books, um, and the books of Deuteronomistic history, um, which we're going to look at next, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. Um, interesting uh, history of Deuteronomy. Apparently, the book of Deuteronomy, the scrolls that contain Deuteronomy, were lost for uh, a big part of history of Israel's history, and they were rediscovered during the reign of King Josiah years and years later in 640 BCE. Um, the story goes that King Josiah found these and realized that um, he and the people were not following God's law well, and so he read the law aloud, um, and they repented, and they tried to get back on track. Um, and it's very appropriate, I think, is because since Deuteronomy really does speak to the people about following God's law, about being faithful um, through thick and thin um, so that they can remain in this relationship with God. Um, and so thus we end the Pentateuch. Um, starting in Genesis, we looked at um, the overarching story of creation and God as creator um, and God as uh, a loving creator to humanity. We also saw that sin and disobedience and rebellion entered the world. And, and from there on, um, it was a sharp downturn, a spiral down. Um, and we also see that God decided to do something about um, this disobedience of humanity and um, it was to provide a way out. So he chose a family, uh, Abraham's family, to bless, um, to give land, to give descendants, and then also uh, for them to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Um, and we see throughout the whole um, Pentateuch that God continues to work with these um, disobedient people so that they will be able to show the character of God, of their God, um, to the people around them. It doesn't happen that much in the Pentateuch, but it's setting up us up for the rest of history um, in the Old Testament where Israel tries and usually fails to be an example to the people around them of God's character and God's love.